Eric is joining us now, okay? He was about to call in, so. All right. Um, so I think we've got, I see 44 participants here. I know there's another like 60 or so on YouTube. And I imagine we're gonna have more people rolling in um, over the next couple of minutes. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and start. Uh, my name is John Duda. I'm a worker owner at Red Emma's. Uh, we are a, or we were a <laughs> restaurant, bookstore, worker cooperative, social space, organizing platform. Uh, we're currently um, totally shuttered because of the coronavirus. And um, I'm really sad that this event, which was originally scheduled to take place in person, where we could all see each other and be together, uh, is um, happening online. But I'm also really glad that all of you have turned out tonight. I'm also really glad that all our panelists have made time to join what I think is gonna be a really important um, and interesting conversation. I wanna thank um, Nicole Fabrica and Sam Collins uh, from Towson University um, for um, doing the, you know, all of the work to make this conversation happen and to really align all the resources on the back end to make sure that it, was, uh, that it could be a success. Um, I think, you know, we're in for a long crisis here. Um, the trouble that's kind of unfolding, we're, you know, we're in like, you know, the early part of Act One, I fear. And I think the long-term long -term partnerships between social movements and resources like universities are gonna be um, just really essential. So I'm really excited that we have, you know, such awesome engaged scholars um, that are able to uh, make things like this happen in Baltimore. Um, and then, yeah, I want to thank everybody here for joining us. Um, I think it's going to be a really, uh, really fascinating conversation. Okay, um, so what are we talking about today? Um, well, I want to start off by just talking a little bit about something that occurred to me as I was thinking about why it is that it's important for us to be coming together and bringing these stories to light. And oddly enough, it goes back to like Manchester in the 19th century. Um, so Friedrich Engels, who's uh, Marx's kind of partner, funder, um, comrade, uh, writes a book that's a really wonderful little book called The Condition of the Working Class in England. And it's really the start of like urban studies. Um, and he writes about Manchester, which is this, you know, gritty industrial city. Um, and he writes about how the geography of the city is laid out. And he says, you know, you can land at the port and you can go up the fancy shopping street and you can go all the way through the town and all the way up to the fancy um, you know, country estates on the outskirts of the city. And you will never once see the people who are suffering and dying uh, because of the conditions that, have, uh, that, have, you know, that are reigning in that city. Uh, you will never once see the base of, of you know, the real life that people are enduring. Um, and that invisibility is, you know, when I think about Baltimore, I think about, I think exactly about that, right? I think about a city where many, many people um, can live in a bubble and never quite understand what is happening, um, never quite understand the pain um, and the struggles that are taking place all around them. And in many people, they, they don't want to. Um, but I think it's important for, for scholars, for activists, um, for platforms like Red Emma's and others to always be trying to make sure that we're keeping, um, keeping this visible, right? Keeping the, the visibility of the reality of this city in the forefront of people's attention. Um, and I think it's especially vital now because coronavirus has multiplied this by you know, a thousand fold, right? Um, everything is practically invisible at this moment, right? We are all um, experiencing our own little private crisis. Um, you know, some of us are working from home, other people are incarcerated, other people are essential workers who are getting, you know, are still forced to go into dangerous workplaces. Other people are freaking out about how they're going to pay their rent uh, in a day or two. Um, and, you know, all of this is unfolding, right? And all of the history of a, you know, a systemic economic collapse is all unfolding all around us. And we are as far apart from each other and as invisible to each other as we ever have been, right? Um, so forget about, let alone, you know, coming together in the streets and contesting all of this and demanding something better, we can barely see each other. And so I think conversations like this are really, really vital and really important. Um, it's, it's a challenge when so much injustice is happening and we can't actually make it visible in the way that, for instance, um, people made the struggles around police brutality visible five years ago during the uprising, right? We had an, uh, you know, 
for that brief moment, um, the long, long, you know, decades, centuries of, of pain and struggle in Baltimore uh, were made visible to an international audience. And that kind of spotlight is what we need on what's happening today. And it's really difficult to get it uh, when we're all, you know, here stuck on Zoom. Um, so that's what we're going to be trying to talk about tonight. Um, we're going to try to be kind of surfacing some of the amazing work that's been going on and will continue to go on all across the city. Um, but also because we have such a great collection of organizers here, um, we have Eddie Conway from the Real News and Tubman House. We have Marvin Hayes from the Baltimore Compost Collective. We have Jamal Jones from the Baltimore Algebra Project. We have Eric Jackson from the Black Yield Institute. And we have Adriana Foster from the United Workers. Um, because we have this you know, really incredible group of people here. Uh, we want to learn as much as possible from them uh, about what they think needs to be built and how we could help. Um, and I encourage people as you're listening to this um, to think about how it is that you can contribute. Normally when I do an event at Red Emma's for like an author event, I'm like, oh, you should support Red Emma's and, you know, support the author by buying books from us. And I still think you should buy books from Red Emma's. If you're, if you're in the market to buy books, go to redemmas.org slash books, buy them from us, don't buy them from Amazon. Right. Um, you know, Amazon is crushing worker organizing um, and doing all sorts of shady shit at the moment. You don't need to support them. You need to support local alternatives. Um, but if you're looking for somewhere to donate, if you're looking for somewhere to contribute with volunteer power um, or anything of the sort, I encourage you to not worry about Red Emma's, but to really throw in with the grassroots organizations that are fighting on the front lines um, that we're going to hear from tonight. And I hope uh, the panelists can all um, as we go, give an indication of how, how best to support um, their work. Um, so with that, I wanna start the conversation. Um, and I wanna start off by asking our panelists to reflect a little bit about history. Um, I wanna ground this conversation in place um, and in the struggles that have happened in that, in that place. So I'm gonna just go around and ask people to, to say a little bit about the place in Baltimore where your work tends to happen. And, and what you could say about the history of that place. And Eddie, do you want to start us off? And you're muted, Eddie. All right. Yeah, I, I work at uh, <clears throat> Tudman House. Um, I started working there. We had some in prison for 44 years. Um, as a former member of the Black Panther Party. I met a lot of prisoners in the prison system. Uh, what we found out was that a lot of them, it came from the Sandtown, Winchester area. Uh, and uh, upon further investigation, we found out that Gilmore Homes is the epicenter of where most of the brothers came from. So there was a plan at some point as we were organizing in jail to come out in the community and to work with the young people in Gilmore Homes to have them uh, equipped and prepared to avoid going from the school to the prison. Uh, so we decided to create a community center. We decided to kind of like see what kind of support we could give the families and young people, et cetera. So we started uh, down there a couple of years, a year before I got out, and uh, two years before Fred Gray was uh, killed. In fact, he was killed right between both of our site locations. Uh, we were on one block and on the, another block, in the middle of that block, Freddie Gray was killed. Um, they've just knocked that building down. But um, what we decided was that the best way that we could help the community um, was to create programs that would cover them and help them um, one spend their money where they needed so we would try to supply food we did supply food we're supplying food now in fact uh and uh so every wednesday and sunday we still do a massive food giveaway in the community but we wanted to train the young people how to grow food. So we took over several lots, about eight of them. Uh, we converted them into an urban farm and we started growing farm uh, of food. Um, 
we also created a fruit orchard. So we got about 14 fruit trees. Some of them are two years old, some of them are three years old. Um, so that at some point in that neighborhood, there'll be trees, there'll be fruit. And as, as the youth, I used to love to run and get fresh fruit, et cetera. But um, so right now, um, if we look at what the corona has done, it's done kind of shut down everything, but we're still operating. We're operating with social distance, uh, face masks, uh, gloves, et cetera. Uh, our volunteers are down there. I'm too old to be down there. Uh, I'm at risk. Um, but uh, so that's where we are. We're at the epicenter of the majority of people that go to jail in Maryland comes from that area. The majority of people that come back home from the jail systems, Hagerstown, uh, Jessup, uh, ECI, or Cumberland, come back to that area. Uh, so that's what we're dealing with right now. I think we are at the heart of the problem. Oh, uh, John, is that enough? <laughs> yeah, I think that's good. <laughs> I think that's good. I don't want to overdo it. OK, I'm going to mute then. <laughs> Um, Adriana, do you want to give us a little sense of the um, where the work that you're doing is happening and what the history of that place is? Sure. So um, I am a leadership organizer with United Workers. We've been around since 2002, and we've organized in lots of different places throughout Baltimore City and throughout Maryland. Um, we uh, hold a land and community ownership in Harlem Park and in Curtis Bay. Uh, my Organizing work has primarily been focused in East Baltimore, McEldry Park, um, and the neighborhoods around McEldry Park. And uh, it's a historically red line community that's seen decades of disinvestment um, with unemployment, underemployment, vacancy, um, and where there really is uh, still the evidences of these policies that have been set up to uh, disinvest and segregate you can cross one street and the neighborhood is dramatically different. The housing prices, the demographics, all of that. Um, and the history of the area as it relates to uh, serial force displacement has been well documented and felt by hundreds, thousands of Baltimore families as they have been pushed out of their communities by Hopkins expansion over several decades um, with redevelopment projects. and. Although that, that is the case and there's still large scale speculation, the buying and selling of vacant property where uh, people with profit interests are gambling on our neighborhoods, there is also a strong legacy of resident leadership um, where people are fighting back, they're organizing, they're crafting their own vision for the community and making sure that needs are met. And so my work uh, with the Eastside Human Rights Committee and with United Workers um, is to bring residents together to think about the history of the area and the forces that we're up against that have created th these conditions, and then to determine what is our plan of action uh, to enact our own vision for our own lives and our own communities. Um, so we're building development without displacement, uh, using community land ownership as a tool. Uh, and so we're pushing for community land trust and permanently affordable housing because we believe that housing is a human right and not a commodity. Um, and we are, you know, I think up against uh, this process where there are new tools that are being used to uphold old injustices. So you had historic redlining and the redlining map of the 1930s, but the market topology map that the city used looks exactly the same. And so there's still decisions being made about which neighborhoods should be invested in, which people should be invested in and which ones shouldn't be. Um, so we are at uh, the intersection of a lot of different issues, but believe that we are building a movement to end poverty led by the poor and want our human rights to housing, to environment, to uh, development that meets our needs to be respected and upheld. Awesome. Uh, Jamal, do you think you could give us a sense of uh, where I know Baltimore Algebra Project works across the city, but it'd be great to hear about some of the specific places you're focusing. Sure. So uh, my name is Jamal Jones. I work with the Baltimore Algebra Project. 
have for over 10 years um, and I serve as a co-executive director. We do two things primarily, youth development work in the form of advocacy and that can come in the form of any kind of campaign um, as five years ago taught us. And that also looks like running student led cohort math groups. And sometimes that's during the day, sometimes that's after school, but we operate as a vendor for the Baltimore School District. We operate currently in schools like um, EMAPS, the Elementary Middle Alternatives Program, which serves students who are 16, who may have um, credits that only align with eighth grade so that they can get uh, bumped up to graduate sooner. We've also worked in schools like Poly. We've also worked in schools like Lake Clifton. So we've worked in a range of schools with a variety of students from quartile one, high achieving with people who the structures and current systems work well with and also with quartile four students or quartile one students who may have not had um, systems and structures in place to work with them to make it so that they did achieve, which is ultimately the goal. Um, currently, we are on hold, like everyone else, kind of sheltering in place, developing out what turn what's turning into be a virtual tutoring uh, program and figuring out ways to monetize the, um, the, the knowledge-based work that the young people have been doing. So developing our trainings and all of those things, similar to what other people are probably doing at this moment, because like everyone else on this call, our work is very centralized in people. And with schools being shut down and being told to shelter in place, it's real hard to organize people or students or any of those things. So right now it's about development. So we've been kind of issuing out things that we want folks to like work on, read, um, including uh, Big Brother Eddie's book and other excerpts of other things that we see as development points because coming out of this COVID stuff, what we know is that wor the world won't be the same. So we can't be the same coming out of this and that it's gonna take some level of transformation to adapt. Awesome. Um, so we had we did have a request from the chat for people to make sure to speak up. Um, I think people had a little a little trouble hearing you, Jamal. Um, so um, just a friendly request there. Um, Eric, do you want to tell us a little bit about Cherry Hill? Sure. Um, peace, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Brother Eric. I'm, um, I am uh, privileged to serve as a servant director of Black Yield Institute. Um, in uh, many ways, I mean, our work is across the city, um, but we definitely have work that is situated in Cherry Hill. Um, and I ain't going to uh, do the, the thing. I know, you know, Jamal put the chain up, but I mean, I, I got to, I got to, I got to, uh, but no, um, I, um, it, it's all love. I'm just, I'm just messing around, but I work in Cherry Hill is, um, is, um, I mean, I guess we'll have an opportunity to talk about this later, but our work is around black land and food sovereignty and the way that we talk about our place-based work in Cherry Hill is uh, essentially, um, I would say, our uh, possibility projects, right? What does Black land and food sovereignty actually look like on the ground beyond, you know, uh, talking about it and um, doing, you know, um, coalition building or action network building? What does it actually look like to have land and to have food institutions that are owned and controlled by the people? And so that's, uh, that's what we've been attempting to do. Uh, here in Cherry Hill for some time. I, I have also the uh, the privilege to have uh, grown up in Cherry Hill. I grew up born and raised here, uh, late 80s all the way up until uh, now as my work is here. And um, just talking about the history, Cherry Hill is probably one of the only uh, communities that was developed as a black community in Baltimore City. Um, and it's not the only, it's definitely one of them um, that, and, and I think that for me, at least the way that I talk about this community developed for largely by the city, um, not out of benevolence to black people, but particularly because uh, there was a need for um, returning veterans from World War II to be housed somewhere in a bustling and overpopulated city. Um, it was like, uh, I mean, John, you already broke the ice on cursing, so I'm going to just keep it going. They tried, you know, the, the, the thing was um, finding the shittiest land 
Um, it wasn't, again, out of benevolence. It was about figuring out where Black folks uh, were going to be housed because the federal government said uh, through the GI Bill um, that they had to house uh, Black folks. And so uh, people who lived in, in uh, Baltimore proper were moved to, to Cherry Hill, uh, what became Cherry Hill in 19, around 1945, as well as families uh, migrating uh, from the South in the Great Migration. And so this, this uh, community became a community, essentially uh, in the community that I inherited, uh, born in 1986, uh, was a community that was very much about uh, materializing black power, even though, you know, that wasn't something that uh, folks maybe walked around saying, but you, you'll see it in examples of, you know, our street names and, um, you know, how we kind of operate and how we have operated um, over time. And so um, this is a community that for those who may be uh, listening in, who haven't had the privilege of being in Cherry Hill, uh, is a place that you will find um, not only the strong uh, Black pride um, and Black power, I would say, you would also find a very green uh, space. We grew, I grew up on the water crabbing and fishing. Um, you'll see a space that have tons of different varieties of trees and birds. And I, I lift that up because when you think Cherry Hill, maybe us on the call, uh, you know, on the panel, or maybe those who might think about like Cherry Hill. Ah! But I grew up in a community that I often say when I get on my preacher tip, um, where you can see prostitute and possum, you can see drugs and deer, right? I want to make sure all of that, that narrative is being shared. Uh, I didn't realize that privilege until I got older and I started to travel a bit. And it's like, I don't think I ever been, uh, ever grew up um, or ever been to a place uh, up until a few years ago when I moved from Cherry Hill, as my family expanded, like where I didn't live with other living creatures, you know what I'm saying? And this was an experience um, that we had. And so um, very interesting and, and uh, the organizing tradition uh, continues on and um, there's a significant history with uh, certain personalities and certain organizations here in the community around organizing to, uh, to get certain uh, amenities in this community, but largely where we're situated is a community that has over time shown different levels of black power and through our work in Black Yoda Institute uh, looking to um, continue that tradition, that radical tradition. And Marvin, uh, give us a uh, sense of where your, your work with the Compost Collective happens. Excellent. Uh, I just got to start out since uh, Brother Jamal uh, shouted out, I'm coming live to you from Sandtown, Winchester. Um, I'm in the 1700 block of North Curry Street where the unrest, uh, where Freddie was chased at, which is still a hamster dam. I'm the program manager for the Baltimore Compost Collective. We serve the amazing Filbert Street Garden, which I call the Wakanda of South Baltimore, where we don't make vibranium, but we do make black leaf gold compost. A little education, composting is just the uh, decomposing of organic material that turns into this black humus called black gold. So I train you for a small scale composting and we serve uh, Federal Hill, Locust Point, Riverside, Curtis Bay, Brooklyn, and we bring those food scraps to the Filbert Street Garden. Why, this so, why is this so important to the Filbert Street Garden? Because it's essentially in a food desert. It takes my youth compost, a big shout out to Mr. Kenneth Moss, uh, about a half an hour with him and his family to get to a market that's not filled with GMOs and uh, processed food. So we provide the soil enhancer. We bring those food scraps back to the Filbert Street Garden. We process them and turn it into black gold. When you put compost back into the soil, it sequesters carbon into the soil. And we know in Baltimore City, we have some polluted soil. But if you add carbon back into the soil, it sequesters carbon. Another reason why this is so important to this community, because it is one of the most toxic neighborhoods in Baltimore City. It has two incinerators, one that burns medical waste that's in overdrive right now, because John Hopkins and all of the other hospitals are burning their medical waste. Right now we have these one use gloves and masks that are being burnt there. And it's been a pandemic in Curtis Bay. Uh, they put incinerators in poor neighborhoods, but one thing about the wind, it does not segregate or discriminate. So we're all being affected. So it's so important 
that we train youth and educate the affected people of Curtis Bay, Brooklyn, Westport, Cherry Hill, Lakeland, Federal Hill, the whole city and educate people, even the people to understand where your food waste, when you uh, send your food waste, where is it going? When it goes into the incinerator, it creates a daily chemical called carbon dioxide. When it goes into the landfills, it creates a, a harmful chemical called methane gas, which is causing us to have one of the highest asthma and cancer rates. So right now, uh, we are fighting for uh, to have the Clean Air Act appealed. Um, I did my first hippie-like thing um, where we did a die-in on Earth Day. And me, about 35 other activists laid on the ground and explained uh, to the mayor that we need some appeal. We need a new deal because people are dying. Uh, the young people are being affected and the people of Brooklyn and Curtis Bay. And as long as there's money to be made from poverty, we will still uh, deal with these issues. Um, currently, right now, we are still providing soil enhancer because it is growing season. So uh, please, Compost Awareness Week is on uh, May the 8th. I will be showing you how to use compost, um, how to sequester carbon and put it back in land. But what I'm asking for everybody to do is to be responsible with your waste by creating three waste stations at your house. One for your waste, one for your recyclables, and one for your compost. My goal for Baltimore City is that we build a large scale composting facility where I can turn hustlers into haulers, where I can hire the young people, the squeegee guys, they may not be composters, but they will be job ready. So that is the fight that we're fighting down in Curtis Bay uh, in Brooklyn for clean air so that we can breathe because so many people have been affected and our children are dying. So thank you. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so that's all just a, a really um, fantastic kind of like geography <laughs> of organizing and resistance from really all across the city. And I think one of the things I'd like to do is ask folks, you know, we are, um, you know, we are um, really in the middle of reflecting on the, the fifth anniversary of the death of Freddie Gray, at the hands of Baltimore City Police, um, the fifth anniversary of the uprising, which I, I would think is probably the biggest mass protest Baltimore has seen in at least half a century, um, if not more. Um, and I think, you know, with the leadership um, that was demonstrated, you know, from the community level, like really making that resistance, and that, that outrage manifest, I just want to invite people to just take a minute to give us your thoughts on where we are five years later. Um, what's what's changed, what hasn't changed, what's now possible, what's still as hard as ever. Um, and if anybody wants to go first, feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Marvin, you're on mute. <laughs> Marvin, you're on mute. All right. <laughs> There was a policy in the army about volunteering for stuff. You just didn't do that. Uh, but under the circumstances, I, you know, I looked at first place um, five years ago. Um, that uprising was manipulated and contrived by the powers to be in the city, the police department, the uh, official government, etc. They shut down Mondamans. They forced those children down to Pennsylvania North. They created that hysteria and they changed the narrative from uh, cops killing Freddie Gray to young thugs in the street. That was deliberate. Now what's changed in those five years? Uh, I work at The Real News, so I've been watching the, the city for five years. Nothing has changed. There's been some tokenism um, here and there. There's been a few pennies directed toward giving a few young people jobs, et cetera, et cetera. The conditions in the city, as far as I'm concerned, are worse. Uh, they are continuing to tear down buildings. They're continuing to uh, allow uh, abandoned buildings and lots to fester throughout the black communities. Meanwhile, they're taking money to create Port Coverton, to, to create, uh, they're getting uh, tips 
uh, a half a billion dollars uh, that we're gonna have to, I'm not we, because certainly not me, but our children and our grandchildren are gonna have to pay uh, for these bonds and so on. So I, I'm of the opinion right now that Baltimore need to step up its organizing and it needs to figure out how to create uh, a coalition of organizations that, uh, that cross the whole spectrum of problems from, uh, from gender rights to uh, unemployment to uh, mass incarceration to um, to the actually the, the the problem with the drug traffic in Baltimore is the problem of Baltimore not having any hope or any way into the future for young people uh, to see something other than creating an alter, uh, alternative reality for themselves. So I'm 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 probably pessimistic. But uh, I'm just looking at what's in front of me. Anybody um, disagree with that assessment? Anybody want to add something? I know Marvin, you were trapped for a, a bit, and I think you're muted. Yes, I apologize. Um, I just wanted to comment, like I said when I first uh, was introduced, that I live on the block where the unrest started. Uh, I grew up in Santan, Winchester, Penn North neighborhood. And uh, there were 47 houses on this block. Uh, the block, if everybody can remember, when Bernie, Bernie, Bernie Sanders walked through Baltimore and he said that this looks like a war zone, that's the block that I live on. That's the block where it's an open air drug market at the top of uh, Curry and North Avenue and spans for a whole four blocks. 47 houses on this block, only 12 of them are occupied. So as Brother Eddie said, things have got worse. Uh, our young people uh, are not receiving the supports that they need. Uh, one thing that I have found is that I have not been pulled over and harassed like I was when I grew up around here. I don't have those issues, but yet and still, there's uh, an open air hamster dam, just like the wire here on this block. And as much money came in due to the unrest and we had over a hundred nonprofits and nobody is working together and everybody is working in silos. So um, it's very grim uh, here. Uh, I took uh, in my house, this was a trap house and it took me two years to build it. Um, I wanted to live in my neighborhood, but right now because of the quality of life, I don't know if this is somewhere where I wanna stay. And that's so sad that I feel that way, um, but I feel like I'm like, so I have to keep on pushing to be able to be that positive example for young people who don't have any that's on my block because we all know when they're supported um there's no uh boundaries for them so um as brother eddie said um i have hope but things have not got better here in Santan winchester anybody else want to weigh in adriana jamal eric yeah um if if folks are okay I, i'd like to share um, and I won't do too much because I, I concur with what um, Brother Marvin just uh, you know spoke to and then Baba Eddie um, just just publicly, man. I gotta get back to you. I know I, we said we were gonna get together uh, on that email, uh, Baba Eddie, but I promise you I will do that. Um, but yeah, I, I would say generally just flat out, just like uh, Baba Eddie just said, um, um, I don't think we we're seeing a. Uh, a better Baltimore in the sense uh, that, you know, um, folks look to, I want to speak to that, that point that uh, was raised around pennies being thrown. And I think that, uh, and I call them pennies rather than dollars because um, folks were given money for programs and uh, folks were given money for services. And the last thing, the last time I checked uh, that whether we talking about Santa and Winchester, and let me just also back up and say that there were some folks who were in 21217 who were already doing work that didn't get money and there were folks who came in because of the opportunities. But that's another story for another day if we open that up. But I will say that what, what ended up happening and across the city, dollars went for programs and services um, and that, that uh, farce um, that our communities are underserved or, or underprivileged is uh, not only problematic, it's a lie. 
uh, what we're looking at is um, limited collective power. So as you know, we're talking about, I mean, but even in this moment, and I'm sure we're gonna talk about it, uh, it would be us, the fools. We would be fools if we decided that we're gonna allow this moment to be, uh, to, to you know, take it in the same way, to take some dollars and then leave our, our city the same way that it, that, uh, that it was beforehand. Uh, my thinking is uh, figuring out ways for us, even while there are, you know, uh, pennies coming up that we're utilizing those, um, we're using, utilizing those funds to further our organizing efforts even in uh, you know ways that folks are not able to see publicly um, until this you know um, anyway we'll talk more about the COVID nineteen piece but I think that we are uh, all together looking at uh, a similar Baltimore if not even more uh, tough because you know um, I think in many ways folks are looking and saying well we got all these resources uh, post the the murder of uh, brother Freddie Gray and um, what happened with it. It's caused folks to feel, in some ways, I think, um, even more disenchanted with with uh, systems, and it gives us an opportunity to do further organizing. And I think that this moment creates that same type of uh, atmosphere as well. So, um, Adriana or Jamal, if you want to jump in on this, um, if not, I'll pose another question. Jamal, go ahead, but unmute yourself. You hear me now? Okay, all right. And I, I put my earpiece in, so thanks for the, the note in the chat. Um, I was just having this conversation earlier, and it's interesting. Um, I agree with everything everybody said in totality, and I want to throw something else out there, which is that I think that from another vantage point, there have been some small shifts to the structure that creates the context for Baltimore being like the way that it is that have allowed for people and people who don't work like us and doing the work that we're doing to be able to take a little bit of foothold and build a little bit of, to your point, um, understanding that we need coalition because some of these uh, avenues and some of these spaces just have been not occupied or been occupied by people for so long. And I give the example of like, um, at the Senate level, Mike Miller, right? Like you have people like that who have been in power for the state of Maryland controlling pots of money that impact Baltimore for so long. And that's just been a space that's never been open. But here we are in the legislative session or coming out of a legislative session where this is the first time in decades where that has been something that's been a different power dynamic. And I think that also the, the uprising created the context for the conversation for a lot of the um, the spaces for Black people in Baltimore to be able to make some of the micro progress that we've been talking about. So I think overall, the structure has kind of moved the same, and we'll see generally the same results. And what I think I can attribute the small changes we have had is like due to like the white guilt, due to like a small sense of like the, the fact that we're in the future with some technology and can share some information a bit more. And that there have been instances like the uprising in 2015 where in an attention economy, we had all the attention centered in one place at one time. And that created a little bit of energy. So while I have the same reflections that shit ain't really changed all too much, right? Like, we still fighting for school money. We still try and get drugs out of the community. We still try and get people housing. We still try and get people drugs. I got squeegee. I got three power washers in my living room right now, waiting for the pandemic to be over so we and the G, uh, Outdoor Project, Liberty Rec, and uh, um, the G300 crew down on uh, uh, Orleans and Gay can do some weekly car washes and trying to get people to support that. But you know what I'm saying? A lot of us put on, like, but all I have to say, the, con the conditions, still the same, but I wouldn't expect it to be any much, that much different. It's been five years. What I can say, though, is that what time is yielding is that the window for the conversation for what is possible is moving. And as that window is moving, a lot of the question is, where does it move to? And can we collectively push in a direction? 
Because similar to any object, if we try to move a couch across the room and you moving this way and I'm coming this way and you moving this way, we have no communication and we follow, like my brother Marvin was saying, or like brother Eddie, I mean, brother Eddie already, brother Eric was saying, at the end of the day, our movement is decentralized at any rate. And at best, it's going to be chaos. And so I think while we have similar conditions and while things have dilapidated and gone down, I think that was going to happen anyway. I think that also the other part of this, though, is looking at the ability for our folks like us to still be continuing this type of conversation and the work that's occurred over the last few years. Like, I appreciate Brother Marvin for sharing his position because I know brothers who live in the county who want to live in the city but really don't, like, struggle with that understanding of, like, what the trade-off is in terms of what the quality of life is and what you got to deal with. And hearing and having a brother that I can speak to and be like, yo, let me send you to Brother Marvin because I know he understands exactly what you're talking about and may be able to help with that. Those are windows that may not have been open five years ago because I know five years ago people who answer the phone for me now did not answer the phone. And that has a lot to do with the work that we was all doing back then. And I personally got to attribute that to Big Brother Eddie, who called me into his office and said, Joe, this your city. You need to be out there. And then we started moving. But before then, I, we were similar to all the other nonprofits who kind of sat back and was taking their time minding their business, but then had this elder, a black elder, come and say, you know, come out and actually stand up and move with your people, regardless of your issue area. So what if the schools, they, their lives extend beyond that. And so I think that I don't want to lose that part because I think that that piece is central to moving that window further to get into a point where we can say this view is a nice view. And Adriana, you want the, the last word on this? Oh, I, I mean, I agree. Um, I Movement leaders before me uh, said you only get what you're organized to take. Um, we got to organize, organize, organize. And that's simple, but it's it's difficult work. And I think what I learned uh, in just like being in this city is that there were folks on the ground that were doing the work before the uprising. And there were folks that were on the ground doing it afterwards. And I, I think that having that commitment and that clarity uh, about where we're going and what do we want to build and how do we do that together? How do we identify where we share values and where we share vision? And then thinking strategically about building the power necessary to have our demands met, that's a necessity. You went exactly um, with that to what I wanted to ask next was to, <clears throat> to get people to reflect a little bit and talk a little bit about how they are building power. Um, you know, we've had some questions on the chat. Um, uh, one person who's a, a, a teacher in a, a, a public school asked about, you know, how do we get students and young people uh, engaged in self-advocacy? I know <laughs> many of you can probably talk for hours about that, and it would be incredible. Um, uh, somebody else uh, mentioned, you know, should we be channeling energy into elections? Um, and I'd be really curious to just hear from you, you know, in the light of the work that you're doing on the ground and citywide, what is your theory of how power gets built to challenge the status quo in Baltimore? I know, Eddie, you have great thoughts about, about elections. <laughs> uh, but uh, anybody wants to jump in? Anybody, anybody feel you want to kick us off? All right, I'm gonna be here for you, John. Um, you know, I, I, I think, well, first, let me be clear about this. The elections nationally for 200 years or however long has been the biggest con game in history to the people of the world. Um, there is some things we can do. And of course, uh, you know, over the, the decades I've watched what goes on in Annapolis, watch what goes on in Baltimore City. Uh, uh, we can have some influence, but we're really not gonna be effective. I mean, we can put this person in, that person in and so on, but until we create some power on the ground, until we create a 
force that can make demands and cause consequences. And consequences means like you're out of here or we're gonna get rid of you. We're gonna put somebody in there worthwhile. Um, and until we gain control of the financial apparatus of the city, um, which is really gonna be difficult to do because the people that spend our money are not the people that give the money, which is us. Um, so we're gonna have to figure out how to work through that. But I think in to build power, um, from my perspective, and I'm, I'm, I go back to the lessons of the Black Panther Party, there's power in us. We need to create the cadre, the leadership, the organizations on the ground. We don't need grants. We'd love to have grants. We don't need any support from anybody to create a power base within our community. What we do at Tubman House is that we do teach young people how to raise food. We also create the example that you can take these lots that were, were overgrown, uh, garbage thrown, uh, you can clean them up, you can turn them into a source of food with some of your labor and you can, you don't have to say, well, this is a food desert. We know it's a food desert, what you're gonna do about it. So you, we show the example of what you can do about it. And in doing that, we have managed to attract uh, hundreds of people uh, to come volunteer once a week, sometimes twice a week, sometimes once a month, sometimes once every three months. But in doing that, we are creating positive organizers for the community that has a sense that they're not down proselytizing in the community. They're not down trying to get anything from the community. They're not down trying to promote their name and get grants. Uh, but they are genuinely down there to help the people in that community. And in the process of doing that, they become leaders of tomorrow. They become people that will struggle and make changes in this city. And one final thing I would say is that for my generation, and I talk to my comrades and I talk to people that struggle all the time, it's not our role to tell people where to go and how to do it. Our role right now is to be available if we can give advice, but it's young people that need to take the lead. That do, it's taking the lead right here on this thing here in front of me. It's an example. Young people need to decide where we're gonna go in the future. If we're gonna save the planet, if we're gonna save our community, if we're gonna save humanity. Jamal, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, organizing with young people. Like, what's the what's the theory of building power at the Algebra Project? How is it working? Oh well, I've been thinking about this. This this question is huge, and it, it like struggle. I struggle with it sometimes. Um, Cause so I guess I'll answer on the short version and then the longer version. The short version is for us. The concept is similar to Big Brother Eddie. There's like a multi-generational perspective that has to be taken and an approach that goes towards kind of the collective the self-development of each individual person. And for us, a lot of times that means working directly with young people at early ages, as early as we can, and kind of shaping the most um, direct public good that they receive, which is public education, in a way that they are understanding it as a civic good that they are consuming and a product that they're receiving and being able to say as consumers of a product that they're not satisfied with it and being able to operate with that and having that um, be a container for the, the activation or the kind of manipulation of doing the, the advocacy work and becoming ultimately like politically engaged and civically engaged people. But and this question in terms of Baltimore, which I think is a slightly different question in terms of building power here, 
What I think about is Taron Mitchell and the Goon Squad and folks like that back in like the 60s. I think about like Robert Clay who was murdered. I don't care what people say. I think about um, all of the folks who at different points did the people self-development part and the individual pipeline piece that we're talking about, but also this economic arm. And what I mean by that, and this is why this explanation is longer, there's an ethos in Baltimore that is like nonprofit, which is actually not the best way to economically or, or like impact anything, right? Like structurally you are uh, like handcuffed to a set of criteria that doesn't allow for you to have the sales expense, the economic expansion of a for-profit entity. And so I say had to say everyone who wants to do this work in Baltimore, who wants to do it through the lens of or the structure of the framework of a nonprofit primarily. And what that traditionally does is it eliminates the concept of the for-profit entities that we need to be building up that like the goon squad and folks like Perry Mitchell was talking about with the minority set-asides that create black business and the ability to do those things. Or like um, even down to like what Big Bro was saying about uh, the people who spend our money. I'm tripping every week. The board of estimates releases a agenda on Monday and you got till Wednesday, I mean till Tuesday at noon to send in something if you beef with it. But millions of the city's billions of dollars, which people don't believe that we got, three point five billion if you include operating and capital. Millions of dollars get spent on Wednesday when they get put in on Monday after being submit submitted two weeks prior. But most of the money that you see coming through there, and there's a minority business report that gets reproduced every five years that talks about this. But basically, the majority of the money that even is spent through the public sector goes out to traditionally white men, white male, white men or um, other folks. And so if you think about like how economies are built and how individual small businesses are built so that they can get to a point where these small businesses become medium-sized businesses and can contribute in a way that nonprofits that are focused on the things that we're talking about or organizations or entities or whatever. It doesn't have to have any particular container, but the work is sustainable. Right now, almost all of us are stuck to the pennies, Big Brother Eric was talking about, because while we're trying to fight whatever structural racism and all of these pieces together, somebody might have a hundred thousand dollar budget here, somebody might have five hundred there, somebody might have two million there. But we are literally organizing against forces that have much bigger economic pockets. And so for me, the long term economic like the long term power building strategy has to be like some version of development of the business flow here and getting control of the public dollars in a way that like our border estimates shouldn't be five people where the mayor controls three votes. It should probably be more decentralized. Some people say get rid of it all together. Some people say make it three people. What I would probably profit is make it the entire council so that every constituent in the city has the ability to influence the decision-making process as opposed to this very limited conversation of it's five people or is it three people? Is it the elected people or is it the appointed people? It's actually the people. I want to I want to come back to that whole question around kind of self reliance and and funding and kind of the the independence that uh, kind of production um, and economic activity can convey. But before I do that, I want to I want to ask Adriana to talk a little bit about the what the work the United Workers has been doing because I think it, it speaks to what Jamal has been talking about in terms of structural changes. I know there have been some amazing policy victories. Um, from the United Workers that have been coming out of an amazing grassroots leadership building process. And I think it would be, it'd be great to hear a little bit about those. Yeah, so for us, um, our work is in political education and leadership development. And we use a human rights framework to not only critique and evaluate what it is about our conditions that we don't like, but we use those same set of values to envision what we want and what we're willing to fight for together. And so we uh, bring people together who are impacted by these challenges to share experience, share knowledge, deepen our understandings of the forces we're up against and to identify, do we share these values and how do we uh, create a shared analysis of power in the city, a shared analysis of what's at the root 
of the challenges that we're facing and how we address the problem at the root. Um, and so we have tried over these last several years to build a coalition bringing together renters, homeowners, and people with the experience of homelessness in what was called the Baltimore Housing Roundtable, it's now called the Fair Development Roundtable to more accurately reflect the issues and the work that we're taking on. Uh, but we wanted to, again, address what is at the root of the housing and development crisis in the city. And so we put forward our 2020 vision plan, which called on the city to set aside resources to support permanently affordable housing and community control of development, which would include people not only owning the land in their neighborhoods, but having the resources to be paid to maintain that land and uh, carry all of that work forward, uh, making sure that we're putting the pieces together so that it's a sustainable uh, move uh, away from uh, the disinvestment and the profit seeking behavior that is dictating the way that our neighborhoods look right now. And so, uh, Let's see, I don't know how to make this short, but essentially over the last several years, we uh, did a few ballot initiatives um, trying to claim space within city processes like was just spoken to where we don't have a lot of decision making power and we aren't able to uh, put forward our own vision. So we tried to reshape that and we were able to create a fund within the city that was puts resources aside to support affordable housing for people at 50% of the area median income and below and half for 30% of the area median income and below. And looking at this in a long-term way, we're advocating for community control of land and that's 99 year leases. Uh, so we're talking about you know, that we had to have a, a source of resources and really a commitment from the city to support permanently affordable housing and these permanent solutions that we were advocating for. And so as of this year, we are, there is money in the fund uh, to support uh, community led development. Uh, we are so working through that process, but have leaders from the community who are renters, who have the experience of homelessness in spaces of governance of this fund and trying as best we can to, to ensure that there's power there uh, to, to uh, maintain why we fought for the fund and ensure that we we don't just celebrate the win but we enforce the win and make sure it's implemented in ways that uphold our values and does what we designed it to do what we wanted it to do which is to dramatically change the conditions in our communities and the instability we are faced with um, and i guess in addition um, we are always trying to think about how do we hold all of our values at the same time of universality equity transparency, accountability, and participation. And so we put together a zero waste plan, like Mr. Marvin spoke about, that is uh, building on years of work uh, that folks in South Baltimore have done and folks across the city to push back against polluting industry and our city's reliance on burning and burying our waste and put forward a resident-led vision for how do we make a transition that upholds our right to breathe clean air and to have healthy lives and to uh, have protect uh, and mitigate climate change. And so we're thinking about how do we promote workers' rights in all of this? We're demanding large amounts of resources to be directed to our neighborhoods um, and to right the wrongs of the past. And so we wanna make sure that there's worker-owned cooperatives and that we have the opportunity to organize and that workers are paid a family sustaining wage. We're trying to put forward a broad but comprehensive vision for the change that we want. And we are seeing uh, because of building power and claiming space, uh, some, some significant victories, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, so Eric or Marvin, do either of you wanna jump in on this and talk about what building power looks like for you and your work? Yeah, if you don't mind, uh, Brother Marvin, you, you wanna uh, take it? I could. Uh, Marvin, you're muted. Really um, Please, Brother Eric, you go ahead and go forward and I'll follow up after you. I apologize. Okay. It's okay. difficult these down here in San Time. <laughs> um, give thanks. So uh, I'll, I'll try to be brief. I think uh, for us, uh, the way, way that I think about uh, power building is in similar ways that what we talked about um, 
the 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 coin, if you will, uh, fa- uh, phrase is um, uh, systems change or structural change through uh, self governance, right? So the thinking is in a similar way that I interpret the history that have been shared through the works of organizations like Black Panther Party for Self Defense and other organizations throughout uh, um, Black Power Organizing um, is that folks have, um, for example, right, there's questions from teachers or what have you. Um, lots of things that have come that have come from these struggles are not properly, you know, um, uh, narrated and not narrated by the same by the right folks. Uh, I know for a fact that now that I have this history that um, the privilege that I had going to public school and having a uh, free lunch mostly and reduced lunch when when we had it good a little bit um, came from the tradition of uh, you know uh, school uh, breakfast and school meal uh, uh, meal programs for school age children right uh, out of survival programs for Black Panther Party um, and then other other, other uh, efforts that became uh, co-opted by government I think that learning from those past experiences doing as much as we can on the ground uh, collecting our own data owning our own narrative around it and sharing those things and being able to uh, scale up if you will out of that and so what we're doing right now, our you know kind of five-part uh, approach to addressing what we consider as food apartheid uh, in in our city and and you know across around the world and throughout the African diaspora, our hope is to be able to utilize uh, research and knowledge creation as a way to um, further our political education work and build um, uh, develop leaders out of out of that work and out of that space, um, while also utilizing our farming work and our um, our food co-op development work that we're doing as well as ways to do a couple of those things that uh, Brother Jamal talked about, the economic piece, and thinking about ways in which like we can kind of operate, particularly our organization and our organizing efforts, try to make all the mistakes we can, learn what we can around uh, how to maximize the nonprofit structure to actually build entities that are owned by people, right? So for example, we've been working over the last couple of years, last, uh, this is year two for us, um, in organizing for uh, what we're calling at this moment, Cherry Hill Food Co-op. The effort is a cooperatively owned grocery store uh, in South Baltimore. And our hope there is to be able to establish an entity utilizing uh, foundation dollars utilizing labor from Black Yield Institute to help prop up this institution that will be owned by the, uh, largely by the consumers. And if I had my way, largely owned by uh, Black and Brown and, uh, you know, legacy, you know, community members in South Baltimore um, to kind of do a little bit of both. But we're also utilizing some of the smaller tactics like uh, when, when we are harvesting our food or when we procure food from other Black farmers, um, through our pop-up markets, we utilize that as, a, as an opportunity to, to touch folks uh, as we are uh, sharing goods for dollars or sharing goods for goodwill. We're also uh, doing our best to educate. And so we're utilizing all of those tactics. Those are just tactics and food is just a vehicle essentially to build, to build power and build the types of institutions that we need to, to erect what we consider as black power, right? I'll, I'll borrow from uh, Dr. Amos Wilson's work, uh, Blue, Blueprint for Black Power. He talks about building these coalitions and developing the type of economic models that, that, uh, that show. And so honestly, what, uh, show what black power looks like. And so for us, that's ultimately what we're, what we're attempting to do, figure out the ways in which we can make all the mistakes we can, um, expand our farming efforts that ultimately the goal is to have it be uh, worker owned, but we want to prop it up as, uh, as well as we can. That inc- uh, includes um, having site control or ownership um, of uh, land in uh, South Baltimore that we're working on now, uh, federal land. And the hope for us is to be able to see whatever we can do here to, again, um, collect all the data, all the information that we need to share so that we can, uh, in the ways that it is uh, um, 
duplicable uh, that we're actually able to duplicate that in other areas because I believe that it's no way possible for us to get to black land and food sovereignty or whatever modicum, whatever vision we have and carve out over time because that's an evolving question. Um, I think that the way to do that is to keep trying it, try it in different places and, and have it evolve over time. And then maybe we scale it up by saying, hey, look, government, we've been tracking this. We've taken our own data. Here's the language and we own this narrative um, and keep it going. Um, I think that at this point, we use anything that we have at our disposal to, uh, to build power, but it happens through consistency and all the different tactics, because where somebody might be uh, come, become a part of our political education work, um, somebody might not be interested in that, but they're uh, getting the same concepts by putting their hands in the soil. Um, and so we're, we're utilizing all of the tactics at our disposal. And when we learn new ones, we figure out what ways we can uh, engage our people. And so th those are the ways in which we're uh, building power, particularly to, uh, to feed ourselves and to be at, uh, at the helm of controlling what goods come into our community, what goods we're selling and how we're benefiting from those um, and, and including the narratives around food as well. So that's, that's how we see the work. And uh, Marvin, any last words on power? And then I yes, I, I just wanted to, I'm going to say this and I'm going to be loud and clear. There is power uh, when you empower other people. Uh, it is imperative that as leaders, we bring our young people to the table and give them a voice. Uh, when you support young people and you bring them to the table, we can't run Baltimore City like we did 20 years ago. We got to bring our young people in and give them a voice whether it may be through arts, may be through photography, may be through poetry or their speaking to bring them to the table. If not, we're not gonna have uh, leaders. Uh, I know myself, I'm in my late forties and I have more time uh, in back of me than in front of me, even though I am a black vegan, a beekeeper and a black farmer. And I bring young people along to show them and try to inspire them that they can be the new environmental social justice leaders for Baltimore City. Wonderful. Um, so I want to ask one more question to all of you. And then um, after everybody has a chance to respond, I want to start peeling off some of these great questions that we're getting in the chat. And if you're if you're connected to the, the webinar, we've got a Q&A function. You can ask a question there. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can ask a question in the YouTube chat. Um, and we'll try and get to as many of those, uh, throw those out to the panel um, as much as possible before we have to wrap up. Uh, but the question I want to ask, and I think it's one that's on everybody's mind, um, is, you know, we're in the middle of a kind of unprecedented situation, right? Where, like, the economy is going into cold shutdown. Uh, there's a pandemic that's raging across the country and is really threatening the most vulnerable populations, right? The populations that have the least resources, um, the black and brown populations that have had the worst connections to and the worst treatment from the medical industrial complex. Um, this is all happening. And I'm really, you know, curious to hear from you all, not just like what this means strategically for, from your work, um, that's, I think that's really important, but also just like, how is this hitting in the communities um, that you're a part of? What are people, how are people dealing? How are people afraid? Um, what do you think is, what is what's going on? And um, I'm not gonna call on Eddie this time uh, or even ask him to volunteer. So somebody's gotta step up. So Eddie doesn't go first again. Eric? You got it, Brother Marvin. Look like you off a of mute. Otherwise, no, I'll go ahead, go ahead, big brother. Eric, you can go ahead. I'll follow after you, sir. No, go ahead, man. I'm yeah, glad y'all two figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, Brother Marvin, you got it. I'll, I'll come back. Um, uh, just here in the Penn North, Sandtown, Winchester area, I see that our young people um, aren't taking it uh, serious. Um, it reminds me of the riot, the helicopters uh, coming in and forcing curfew. Um, they're not taking it serious and understanding that this is threatening our community because of already of the pre-existing conditions that we have by not getting the proper health care and education. Um, once again, more support is coming here as far as food and providing food and support for our elderly residents, but our young people aren't taking this seriously. They're still going about
business as usual, uh, still selling poison to each other, which are destroying and breaking down our community when they had so many resources available after the unrest um, that they could have took advantage of. So uh, right here in Sandtown, I just don't, um, I don't see where um, young people don't think it can affect them and uh, how they can affect someone else by exposing them. So I think we need to do more education and get out and get on that level and go door to door. Um, I know it's difficult during this COVID, but do uh, training through social distancing so that we can educate our young people and citizens of Baltimore. Eric, do you wanna follow up? Sure. Um, so we've uh, definitely had to pivot some of what we're doing as uh, Brother Jamal, Jamal talked about earlier on, like, you know, uh, most of our work is frontward facing. Um, and um, we, so we've done, we've kind of, our mutual aid looks different, right? Um, we've been uh, working collaboratively with uh, community uh, groups on the ground, organizations on the ground to uh, get food donations in, warehouse those. We've transformed, uh, so currently, and this is where I am now, at the Cherry Hill Resource Center, which is a, a former um, elementary middle school. And so if anybody went to an elementary middle school in Baltimore City, y'all know what they look like. Uh, or at least generally speaking, have the schematic. So we've transformed the, the space where we used to eat at our tables and the old, you know, the, the, uh, the elders used to, you know, quiet time, you know, at least they used to tell me, uh, shut up when I was uh, in school. We transformed that space into a, a warehouse and we're uh, bringing in food donations uh, and other resource donations and we're able to share with um, with our community and we've gone through different phases and in all of that what I've found and I have just a bit of a different approach because I've been privileged to be on the ground in this way uh, we've been sharing with um, you know sharing these goods with our community and granted I want to be clear that I even struggle with this because I mean even pushing against food apartheid we recognize that one critical aspect of food apartheid is is uh, corporate control of the food system and and thereby corporate control of our food environment and so we've been able to however though um, take resources that otherwise would have been um, would have been wasted and sharing with our community including not just food goods and those uh you know shelf stable and perishable refrigerated and, and frozen goods but also things like alcohol toilet paper and things like that and in that it gives a bit of it shows me at least um it pulls people out you know what i mean like particularly churches that we're distributing to um i'm finding that folks are um that there's just really an opportunity for us to, even though we kind of practice, we practice as best as we can to be uh, safe and to practice wellness um, and to, to make folks safe, uh, practicing a new type of uh, uh, socializing during this time of social distancing um, and folks just connecting with each other, people getting four and five boxes and taking it to elders, things that I remember growing up with, but moments like these kind of accelerate and exacerbate those things. Um, and I think that for some people it is scary and it's tough, but what we've been able to do through our relationships, um, we've been able to connect with our elders and connect with families and making sure as many as we can um, get in boxes of food for weeks and, and a month and at least up to a month at a time. So we're able to just make sure that people have what they need. And from that perspective, folks are grateful, um, even trying to shift the narrative. Thank y'all for doing what y'all doing. And for us, it's like, thank you for, for coming out because you know this is definitely something that we do together. And so something I've been talking with my team about and the folks that I've been working with on the ground, um, I've been definitely pushing this idea that like this time has allowed me and I'm encouraging others to be good steward of our relationships, our resources and our reason. And these are, and for me, I think that because the news would have us do the opposite, right? To hoard, you know, resources, to forget about people and our relationships and to stop thinking, you know, for ourselves and using our in, in indigenous knowledge and our collective knowledge. And there's been an opportunity for us to share that, to see the good, um, you know, people actually 
where they may not have done something, actually doing it. So I just have a different spin, and I think it creates an opportunity to say, if we can do that in this moment, um, we can do it in a moment outside of this, because where we come from, or at least where I come from, this only exacerbated the issues that we see on the ground and create them. You know what I'm saying? So if we can, if we can operate uh, as uh, people who come from the land and people who come from, uh, you know, from from strong, you know, uh, backgrounds, then I mean, we can do that now. We can do that moving forward. And so that that is what I'm seeing on the ground and the opportunities moving forward. Rihanna, Eddie, Jamal, any of you want to jump in on this? Sure. Um, I, I have a very mixed bag of opinions and thoughts and reflections about how COVID is impacting stuff. Um, I guess I'll start with like students. I think that to the point that Brother Marlon was saying, like there's that whole teenage zeal or that teenage angst or all that. Like p young people tend to have a, a less of a fear of things that we ought to. As a, as that like that's a psychological thing, a part of development, and so like there's a bunch of that at play. But I also I I do want to speak to this greater political evaluation where young people for centuries in this country have not been considered like actual citizens in the context of like when you are a citizen, there are certain things that people have to ask you and and talk to you about before things are done to you. And so if you look at all of the major industries, all of the major spaces that young people occupy, they have very little agency in very in the majority of those spaces. And what agency they traditionally have is usually created through some like effort that they tend to have to like support with through organizing. So I say that to say, um, I think that a lot of what's happening with the response to COVID for students right now is like you the the felt impact is lower because your like level of participation in the greater context of civic life is like lower based on the social standards that's going on. So I think that's part of it. So it's like that's the relationship. It's similar to like the dirt bike riders here, right? Like people say the dirt bike riders, they ride the street, they swear they do all the stuff for traffic. It's like yeah, but that's how outlaw culture is. When outlaw culture, like it's literally outside the law. The culture has to develop without, outside of the framework. So the framework will not fit it inherently. And so it's one of those things where I think that to your point, there's a bunch of education that we gotta do. We gotta bring our brothers and sisters in. Um, and I think the other thing that I worry about my response as it pertains to COVID got a lot to do with the like larger scale economic impact. So you got stuff like the Kerwin Commission, which is basically an, extenu an extension or continuation of the Thornton Commission from 2003, which is supposed to award billions of dollars to public education and a couple more hundreds of millions or a couple billion dollars to Baltimore City over the next decade was like signed into law, but with some amendments that basically said, yo, if we ain't got it, but we lose a little bit of money, we ain't going to have it. And it's like, it's real clear. But I say it to say, like, the people who are in positions to think about policy and budget and our collective dollars and all of those things, they're thinking at that level. They're thinking the corporate bailouts. They're thinking all of those things. And the thing that I have been finding um, in my conversations with young people is it's not the bailouts up there that anybody is particularly worried about. It is the question of, is my mother going to be able to go to work when the majority of people in Baltimore City work in hospitality and they know that their mother can't go to work because the hotel worker or the hotel owner is not giving them hours? Or is I'm going to be able to, you know what I'm saying, like, go to the throw a party because most of the a lot of people here work in a cash economy underground here because the above ground economy got all the stipulations attached to it. So you got a lot of people here that are promoters who literally make their wages, they pay their bills by throwing parties. And right now in a space where you can't social distance, we've canceled their ability to do that. There's a whole lot of black folk that work in these underground economies or work in these cash economies, spaces like hair salons, that I can see very clearly people being impacted. And I'm wondering to what extent 
that has the impact on the development of the young people. It, I like I was listening to something earlier that was about childcare and was talking about like how childcare industry may actually fall all the way apart. And it's interesting because people like me try and compartmentalize that to just childcare, but that's actually all of the spaces where young people are involved, which includes schools. And it's like, well, if childcare might fall apart because of all of these things with social distancing, then what does that look like for the way that we approach public education and the primary good that young people concern, consume? But all that to say, it's some work that got to be done on our end to like develop our people to really understand what's happening. But I think the greater concern for people is this long-term idea of how is everybody going to eat. And I love all the brothers and sisters that's doing all of the food work right now, but I have to share a piece of feedback that I have been getting where, quite frankly, and I'm, I'm a quote, the great feedback is like, it's food everywhere, right? Like, it's people doing food stuff that have not been doing the food work for a very long time, primarily because of, like, that's still work just being like the work that people were doing. But there are other needs that I think that people should like extend. Like for me, I don't necessarily feel like algebra projects should spend time trying to do food collaboratives, but we should try and like fulfill the service or whatever else that we were doing and support folks like Eric, support folks like Marvin who are doing that kind of work where we can and where it makes sense. What I'm seeing right now and what a lot of people are seeing is that like People are worried about if their phones are going to get cut off, and there's a plethora, there's like a, a significant amount of focus on food as a specific thing, and while food is important, and I understand that, I think that the other assessment that folks are making is that there are other needs that people need to focus on that we need to like have done, and there is um, this ethos in Baltimore that makes specific things feel more good or people be more or less rewarded for. So I say that to say, um, I think that COVID gives us the opportunity to, while we're seeing this this expansion of like the, the production of and collaboration of people to do food work, I think that to uh, Marvin and to Eric's point, this is the opportunity for us to expand that beyond the pandemic and through all these other spaces, because we got the ability it's a question of do we have a resource? And I end with um, the only concern that I have about continuing this work is that, quite frankly, the pandemic slowed everything down. So there are people who have who would otherwise be busy, who have had the ability and time, the bandwidth to actually participate in some meaningful way in a lot of these things. And um, I would I would love for the conversation as we're figuring out how to like move forward post COVID to figure out how do we actually um, maintain the level of engagement that we're getting from people and like funneling that energy while at the same time trying to like get back to the day-to-day of people having engagements that require their time. Adriana, Eddie? Okay, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wrestling with this. I, I, Earlier today, I went through Pennsylvania and North and, and surrounding Earth. And so what Marvin is saying, I really feel it. I see it. Uh, it concerns me. But at the same time, I'm in contact with people around the country also. And so I know young people are stepping up to the plate uh, and they're organizing and they're checking on the elders and they're being concerned about the community. Uh, and they're practicing safe distance. So it's the two sides of that coin, but the side that you can see visibly when you, when you go into some of those areas is frightening, but beyond those areas, there are people organizing. But the problem, and I, as far as I'm concerned, and we, we probably haven't touched on it yet, is the capitalist system. It's not working. It didn't work for us. It never worked for brown and black people or red people or yellow people or even poor white people. Uh, and what the impact now on the community is, is that all those institutions have been set up uh, with uh, their, for the most part, white supremacist racist institutes. Uh, and They've never given us care. And now we can go to the hospital 50 times and not get a test. 
but a dog or a damn cat can go and get a test. That's that's capitalism. There's something wrong with this system. And this is the opportunity I think that we need to take advantage of to understand that we don't have to be in those workplaces to work. We don't have to be put in a position where we continue to work in this system. We can find a different kind of way of arranging our lives, arranging our power, arranging our collective ability to move into the future. And this should be a wake up call for us. This should allow us to look at other alternatives, but at the same time, question the institutions that exist. They don't take care of our community. They're not going from door to door and checking on our elders. Right. They're not doing the things that we need done and we can change that. And I think we need to take advantage of this opportunity. So that's how we need to go into the future. We need to be training and teaching. And uh, Jamal, it's, it's, it's like you said, we need to look at all these other aspects. We gotta eat first. If people don't eat, they won't be here. But beyond that, we need to look at all of these other things. Adriana, how about for you? How is COVID hitting around you and your work? I mean, similar to what's been spoken to, um, just a lot of isolation and a lot of uncertainty about where, how rent's getting paid, how food is, is coming in the house. Um, and it just brings to mind all of this, uh, all of what we know about the failures of our system and how they're being exacerbated right now around how we access healthcare, how we access the things we need to, to live and make it from day to day. Um, and in our work, uh, we've had to, we've pivoted uh, and, and developed new ways of, of connection and, and coalition to try to push and organize um, to ensure that the one thing that we've been really focused on and that's been led by folks at Housing Our Neighbors who are um, formerly homeless folks, currently homeless folks and allies, uh, they've been pushing and putting forward this demand that everyone that's currently in a city shelter or anyone in the city that needs to be rapidly rehoused, that that happens. And the city has not made a commitment to doing that. Um, so we've been organizing over the last several weeks in a lot of different ways. And, and one way that COVID is affecting our organizing is that we have to find use new technologies and, and new ways of being connected to each other, but uh, to push uh, and, and highlight that this lack of leadership and lack of action on this issue is going to result in people dying. And so we have put forward demands around housing and around food um, and around resources. And we've developed sort of a new structure under the round table, new working teams that are expanded beyond uh, folks who were formerly or, or existed as members of the round table to bring in new leadership. Uh, there are people who are relating to this, who are organizing, uh, and we have our, we're coalescing around this same set of demands and really been able to uh, try to figure out how are we strategic and ensuring that people are taken care of right now and beyond right now. Uh, one thing that we're doing is we've developed a, a, a mutual aid infrastructure, um, but a part of that is developing know your rights resources because we know that there were already slumlords before COVID. And even though there's a moratorium on eviction, that doesn't mean that your landlord won't try to illegally evict you. Uh, and so we're working with people on landlord tenant issues, um, trying to get resources out about unemployment, about stimulus, uh, how, and, and not just in this moment, but how are we connecting people to legal support if they need it? And how are we developing uh, our ideas about ensuring that after the moratoriums are lifted, that people are stable and that rent is forgiven outright? Uh, and, and what the impact of the housing crisis as it was and the housing crisis as it will be, how we're gonna deal with that um, and how we're gonna organize and, and address those challenges. Uh, and I think some of it, other aspects of the work have been to develop new ways of engaging in political education and engaging in connection because 
of the isolation and uncertainty that people are feeling. And so how there's folks who have been doing this work for a while, but are working together right now to bring in arts and culture and to think about how are we staying connected um, and connecting to our humanity and, and being in relationship to each other, even in this moment, especially because of the moment we're in right now where we can't see each other and hold each other and you know be in the same space. Uh, and then the other part is just how are we continuing the work that we were already doing? Uh, and Mr. Marmer spoke to this already um, about the action last week um, regarding the incinerator, but that all of that is, is in the mix. Um, but just thinking about and centering what are people dealing with right now and how are we equipped and how are we organizing to address the, those needs? That's where we are. Um, so at this point, and I think it goes to this question of how we overcome isolation and keep humanity um, together under these extraordinary circumstances, I just want to acknowledge that there's still like 150 people um, listening to this conversation. And, you know, I think I miss in-person events where those people would be, you know, cheering at like just about everything that's been said and like jumping up with their own stories. And like, I miss that energy a lot. And um, it's a poor substitute for it, but I want to try and bring in some of their, their questions and voices into this. Um, I think we can go for another like 15, maybe 20 minutes. Um, so I think um, if you've got a great answer to one of these questions, jump in and say it. I don't think we have time to go all the way around on every single one. Um, but certainly, you know, if you want to, um, you know, if, if this devolves into an awesome free for all where everybody's like throwing things into the mix, that that would be a great, a, a great way to wrap this up. Um, so one question I want to bring in is uh, around um, the institutional questions. And Eddie, you touched on this a little bit, um, but we've got, you know, we've talked about power, we've talked about, uh, we've talked about capitalism, we've talked about the sort of nonprofit funding setups, we've talked about the, um, you know, the, the, the systems of government and budgeting that happened in the city, uh, but we didn't really get into the role of these large nonprofit institutions, you know, the, the so-called Eds and Meds, right? Um, and the question was around what the role of these major educational and medical institutions is in entrenching inequity in Baltimore. And specifically, and I think this is a really great point, around how they perform solidarity, right? How they um, token make token commitments to, uh, to inclusion, right? Um, but yet are complicit in displacement, right? Are complicit in maintaining a status quo, which is deeply and brutally unequal. So if anybody has any thoughts on that, I think we'd all love to hear them. Go Jamal. Um, my immediate thought is to go to the pilot, the payment in lieu of tax and payment. Um, but what a lot of people misunderstand about that is that it's not just for Hopkins, it's for the, you know, it's like the medical system. And so like, if you look at that payment, it's like 6 million or something like that for the whole thing. And if you think about the trade-off based on just what we would, what we missing in property tax, um, it's a lot, it's a lot, and that's money annually. And I said to say, um, it is to me, how can this be fronting? A lot of these institutions have to posture the way that they need to posture in order to get what they need to get, right? Like, who gonna go to the medical school that also is just like doing the EBDI thing the whole time? We kind of gotta throw some pennies at this other stuff, right? Like, it's the same corporate thing, but with a larger nonprofit because they run the same ways. And I think that the other thing is, quite frankly, Hopkins has figured out that local leadership ain't going to punch them in their mouth, right? Like straight up. I do not know a Baltimore person who has been born and bred here and raised who would let somebody post up on their block or in their area for whatever they're doing and not contribute, right? Like that's just not a thing. That is not an ethos that we rock out with here, but that is a thing that, if you look at like the way that people traditionally think about economics, right? Like they want to capitulate to this large institution to keep it here because of all of the trickle down benefits, as opposed to doing the collectivized power building that traditionally builds like sustainability and individual, like, you know what I'm saying? Like entrepreneurship and all the rest of the stuff we've been talking about. 
But as far as I'm concerned, what really needs to happen is you need to have a mayor or somebody who won't be like, all contracts can be broken. That one is crazy. We renegotiate, put up more bread or get out. Right? Like, and the thing is, people always are concerned about like, oh, the loss of the jobs and all of these things. One, I like to call it bluff. But two, let's say that that is the case. How much, like, the autonomy and, like, the ability that we would be able to gain from losing that, I think it's a trade-off. And I think that, quite frankly, the ethos, the thought mind, the mind, the mental process of people in Baltimore has to get away from the idea we're going to connect to these things that are already established and then kind of auxiliary our way on and get put on has to get shifted away. And we got to get to the point where we're not thinking about Hopkins or those things. We got to think about like the Insaroma Center or spaces like that. And how do we build up those levels? And quite frankly, it requires a level of economic understanding where we realize that all of the money is the same money, right? Like all economies are built on, built on the wheels. And it's like any bag of money is based on those pennies being added up. For stores like Walmart, that's all our sales individuals. For places like the government, that's all our tax money. So we can replicate these very clearly working financial mechanisms, but we got to have a collective ability to do that. And I'll end on, there's a guy named John Morris who works for works with an organization called Change For Real, and they work down in Old Town, um, Old Town Mall. And basically, they that they did a study that showed that like within a however long square mile radius between call it like the area that Hopkins is that includes Hop like all the way down to maybe um, uh, Madison Street, that there's like a square mile area where clearly Latrobe projects are there, Perkins projects is there, Douglas projects is there, but the cent like the the national data said that there was 100 million dollars of annual spending power there. And it was like, the reason why we don't see our pennies that way is because we see our pennies as worthless, but the other folks don't see our pennies as worthless. So if we rock out different, we won't get different. But as long as we got leadership who scared or operate in a way where they genuinely believe that that's the path to victory, we're going to suck. So there's, there's another question in the chat. And honestly, this is a great question. I would, I would love it for somebody to just build like an entire event or even like an entire conference around asking people this question who are doing organizing work. Um, and the question is like, um, what are the mistakes that you've made? All right. So what are the missteps that you've, you've taken in the organizing work um, that you think people could learn from? All right, I know normally we're supposed to share, but I'm gonna jump at this one and go first if I can, because, um, I work with the young people like that. Yeah. I work with the young people in a way that is very different. So the organization is youth run. So they have decision making power and ability over almost all of the things that occur, including like my salary, right? Like that's a thing that the young people now are to get to make decisions about. And um, it's interesting because um, I'm sorry, I was getting a message. Um, it's interesting because one of the things that young people are consistently saying to me as we like move through this this idea of power building and like where do we go and how does this like all map out is like what spaces do people get to occupy long term and how do you things shift for young people in ways that young people structurally here can like be a part of the, the new, a new consciousness or a new level of thinking here that maps across the, the overall civic level of engagement. So like, what does it look like to build a space where young people have a collective consciousness for all of the things that we're talking about so that the next generation of people who emerge in all of these positions of power to do things actually have like the same understanding of things. Anybody else want to chime in with a mistake? I do, um, but Brother Marvin's unmuted. So, do you want to go? I'm, I'm no, cool. All right, go ahead, go right ahead. I had another comment to make. Got you. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm definitely uh, down to always talk about mistakes because uh, I mean that's just how we learn. I think one of the things for sure that we've uh, over the years, I'll say I, I've done. Um, 
over the years that, you know, kind of, it took me being in a fire actually to learn this. Um, I was taking my, uh, my ideology too serious. And um, I was, uh, I think while still, you know, in our organization and I, I self-identify as a Pan-African organizer, like liberation organizer, I think what I, I made the mistake early on of, uh, of uh, choosing not to uh, work with certain people. And in some cases around race and other cases around people who think of a particular way that um, where I just didn't, I think I wasted a lot of time just, uh, if nothing else, creating a, a space where folks didn't wanna work with us, uh, didn't wanna work to help build this thing. And so recognizing that, like, uh, that, that old adage of, like, you know, um, I, I forgot what the, I'm going to paraphrase, if you come, you know, to liberate with us, you know, because, you'll be, because your liberation is bound with ours, then welcome. Um, if, if you haven't, you know, if, if, uh, if you come to, I guess, to feel sorry for us or thinking that you're doing us a favor, we don't want to work with you. Um, and I think for me, I think we, you know, I definitely made that mistake, but I also, uh, because I was, I think for me, it was a fear. It was a fear that if we work with certain institutions and particularly uh, take money from white philanthropic institutions when, when Black Youth Institutes first started and even before I was like, nah, I don't want white folks money. I don't want none of that money. Um, and figured out other ways of doing it, recognized that there was a bit, a lot more talking and less of the work that we were doing. Um, partially just because, I mean, sometimes that's how people move. Um, and so I feel like I, the mistake that I made really was just kind of like understanding that people who say that they were uh, ready to do the work were actually ready to do the work at the time. And that, uh, that we, I was clear about what the work, you know, uh, what I even wanted the work to be and what I felt called to do and what I felt led to do. Um, and then the, the, you know, circles that were organizing over the years, not being clear of that. Um, but I think also another mistake that I've made, even, you know, that we're still working through now is uh, having the right uh, relationships and the right narrative that it would allow us to build the type of, um, I talked about the food co-op um, that we that we need. And in order, doing the, in order to do that, uh, one of the things that I think we have to do um, and I, that I've learned over time is be more, I guess, uh, open-minded to how we actually uh, materialize these things. Um, again, whether it's our farming, expanding our farming work or it's food co-op or, or any anything else. Um, and I feel like at least for me, the mistake that I'm attempting to reconcile now is um, just like sharing things too soon with folks, you know, and um, not just with people, with institutions and, and making sure that um, not only we're being open-minded, but we're being careful about what we're sharing and at what time we're sharing it. One, because I think if we're sharing things too soon, um, sometimes uh, from the standpoint of our people, we start talking uh, about something that we could possibly get and like, you know, erecting a grocery store ain't something you can do overnight, something that takes three to five years at the very minimum. Um, and so those kind of things, I think uh, learning how to be patient there. And then also last thing I'll say, um, like working through the, um, hmm, what's that idea of like uh, the blame the victim piece? Uh, and not this is not personal. This is more so not recognizing the ways in which uh, we have either through uh, things that we've talked through or allowed to be said in, in community spaces and through the work that we uh, project. And so uh, what we've done is really like, or at least for me to, to uh, deal with that particular mistake is just kind of like being consistent and recognizing when somebody comes to you and you're selling food and they like, yeah, this is supposed to be free, but they got their half and half in their hand. Not saying like, yo, you just spent your $5 on a chicken box and a half and half at the uh, Korean American, uh, you know, um, uh, carry out. 
you know, what you're talking about is supposed to be free, but recognizing that history and utilizing that as an opportunity for deeper relationship building, political education. And so that was a mistake that we made early on, getting defensive around that, but uh, having a balance between, you know, applying pressure, as Brother uh, Kevin Gates talked about, being pressure, but also at the same time, uh, recognizing that we're affixed in the historical context and allowing that to be at the forefront of our uh, of our conversations about these types of things rather than blaming people. So those are three things that come off the top that we are uh, either working to or have worked to correct that doesn't uh, serve uh, toward liberation. So I want to take this chance to just summarize, synthesize a whole bunch of questions that have been thrown out and kind of mash them all together imperfectly into one final question that everybody can get a chance to get a last word for this, this what has been a really incredible and I think really valuable conversation so far. Um, and the question is, you know, we know that Baltimore was facing systemic issues, right? We know that we needed transformative systemic change to undo the sort of, you know, uh, unconscionably racialized disinvestment, discrimination, bias, uh, pain that has been in this city, right? Um, and all of you have been doing that work. And now we're looking at this system getting even more dysfunctional, right? Um, even more violent, um, even more harmful to, all, um, to the people who live in this city. Um, what is it going to look like when, how, do, how are we going to win? Right? How are we going to catalyze the large scale systemic change that's actually necessary to, you know, to stand up and, and meet the demands of this moment? Um, how is your work going to play a role in that? And how do you, what do you see victory looking like? So that's a big question. Um, but if people want to, you know, tear off a chunk of that um, and leave us with some last words, I think that would be really fantastic. Anybody want to go first? I'll be very short. Um, I'll say that um, we're going to serve a role by just, um, I said that earlier, by making mistakes and um, providing opportunities for us to, um, to practice liberation. Um, Baba A. Whitfield, who's in, your folks are on the call and know anything about co-ops, will learn about him. A uh, powerful person, he talks about practicing freedom a little at a time. And I think that, that the type of spaces that we're creating and the, um, the processes, that what we consider liberatory processes, um, just allowing folks to be ourselves while practicing, practicing liberation, uh, practicing freedom, practicing uh, equity, whatever language we want to use, um, but we say, you know, practicing freedom. And so what, we, what I want to do is to contribute as a contributor in this work when it's all said and done that Black Yield Institute um, created a space for us to be able to imagine a world that doesn't exist and help to help folks to uh, develop the skills necessary uh, and the capacity and the resources to actually materialize that um, so that we're able to practice something that we haven't been able to. It's one of the things that I will at least say, and these, this will be my absolute last words, the, one of the biggest impacts of uh, uh, white supremacy and racism is on our imagination. And it's on the ability for us to be able to practice the types of things that we talk about. Beyond political education and collective consciousness, we have to have collective action and not just you know going to, uh, going to Annapolis, but being able to practice. So we talk about economic power and social and political power. I want to be able to hold space for us to practice that, make all the mistakes that we can, incubate what we can, and then uh, build that as a part of a larger network. So that's that's what that's what I hope our contribution is to larger freedom, liberation, equality, and uh, equity that we're all you know seeking. I, I would say for the Baltimore Compost Collective, uh, I believe that was a song that. I played at my graduation that said, I believe the children are the future. It should not take a pandemic for our children to get access to computers in 2020. Uh, we should, each child should be able to be provided with the same type of equal education, provide uh, food for children. So we will continue to provide opportunities for young people to be advanced and have a voice and to hopefully 
create that next environmental social justice leader that will create clean air for every citizen in Baltimore City and make sure that we are one Baltimore uh, where everybody has access to all of the uh, uh, all of the resources that they need to be thriving citizens. How about Jamal? Um, I think for Algebra Project, the major focus for like our contribution to like this longer term thing is like getting to or developing out a pipeline and ability to get to our young people in the city as early as possible and developing them out both in like in terms of a set of political consciousness and a set of like political acumen and articulation that allows for them to participate in civic life in some meaningful way, but also like getting people the types of educational opportunities, not school, because school is a building with like some bricks and some tables and maybe some people sometimes, I don't know, it depends, it depends on where you're at, but um, giving young people the types of educational opportunities that actually develop them and grow them and stick with them. Like Algebra Project uses a five-step pedagogy that usually includes games like Twister to teach public pedagogy, like uh, using using a Twister to teach probability through our pedagogy. So like having folks actually play games of Twister and like doing those things, but actually ultimately being able to develop out the types of educational experiences, whether it's like a game or going on a trip or being a part of panels like these, but what are the types of educational experiences that ultimately actualize people in ways that like, we have the types of Baltimore folks that we know going to carry the city one way or the other and not going to drop it. And I think like that's the major thing for us and whether that's like through building some form of youth advocacy campaign for individual things for schools or money for schools or doing any individual work like we've worked in partnership with Tubman House before we've worked in partnership with other folks and actually getting closer with other people on the call work with United Workers like you know what I'm saying like that kind of thing but also like what does it look like long term to build all of the pieces to like to the point we were all making before on all of these fronts and expanding that but for our contribution being specifically like the young people and making sure that that development range of understanding is connected to all of these other things we're talking about as everybody's pushing out into individual um, ecosystems. And the last thing I'd say is um, Black elders. A lot of times when young people in the city get connected to these organizations, they get connected to the white nonprofit leaders or the staff leaders of those folks. And that then creates the orientation, the framework, the position, the rest of that stuff for those young people. And I tell you, I take Eddie every day over one of them. Because they're not, Eddie's not going to do me wrong. Eddie's not going to lead me to a different, because there's a different relationship. And all your skin folk ain't your skin folk, but sometimes the connection is complexion. Yeah. Adriana, you have thoughts you want to leave us with on how we win, what it looks like? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Um, I mean, I think our role uh, in this is just to hopefully build the sort of connections that have been spoken to, but to continue the work and continue building the alternatives. I think what's uh, what I find uh, really meaningful about what we're doing is we're not just challenging the city or the government or our current system to uphold our values, although that in our priorities, which is a part of it, but we're also building their alternatives. We're not waiting. Um, and so I think that we have to continue with that work and to continue to uh, reflect on the actions that we're taking, what are the mistakes that we're making or what new ideas or challenges do we have to hold? Um, but just continuing to organize and continuing to create the space for shared analysis and, and collective action. And I was looking something up um, and I've been thinking about this a lot. Uh, it comes from the University of the Poor. I wish I could shout out the author of this, but um, it says that many of our best answers are likely ones we discovered before this crisis, but haven't had the will or ability to move forward with. And that mm -hmm. has been like sitting with me every day just to know that like many of the folks, the folks who are here, of course, but also many others, our <clears throat> answers and our solutions 
we already know what they are. Uh, and we have to do the work in this moment to make sure that we can we can make those demands and win. Uh, and that's complex that's and challenging, but we have to. Eddie, last words? Yeah, you know, uh, I was listening to everybody and I agree. Um, and I was just thinking of the 100 years ago, there was a pandemic uh, and it uh, killed millions of people, in fact. Uh, uh, 500 years ago or more in uh, Europe was devastated. I mean, this we will move beyond, but I think what's important to, to understand is that we have examples uh, say Greece, say for instance, uh, economy flatlined, uh, the institutions collapsed, uh, people came together, they organized uh, workers' co ops, they organized health co ops, they organized transportation, they took control of the means of production. The same thing happened in Argentina back uh, 20 some years ago. People stepped up to the plate, they organized, they did something and Red Embers is a good example of that. They created workers uh, uh, co-ops. They went in to the factories. When the factories shut down, they opened them up. They got the supplies, the resources. They created the distribution networks. They worked it out and we can work all this stuff out too. It's the, the problem is if we try to recreate, whether it's black capitalism or whatever kind of capitalism, we try to recreate it, we're always gonna have people at the top and we're always gonna have people suffering in mass down at the bottom. So we need to find another way out. And another way out is collective operating co-ops and creating our own institution. Because to the degree that we create our own institutions, we disempower the blood suckers that's taking our money and taking our power. When we create our own institutions, then they become weaker and we become stronger. And that's our way out of this to the future. That's my last word. So this is the part where if we were all in person, we would have a thunderous standing ovation and we would thank all of these amazing people who have spoken and given us so much to think about and be inspired by. Um, we're not gonna do that. Um, I would look stupid if I got up and started like cheering in, in my house and my dog might freak out. Uh, <laughs> but I am gonna say that the way to thank these folks is if you found this useful, um, share it. It's on YouTube right now, um, or it will be as soon as we end the meeting. Um, share this with other people, um, continue this conversation, um, you know, look these folks up, right? Look up United Workers, Baltimore Algebra Project, Tubman House, Black Yield Institute, Baltimore Compost Collective, right? I'm sure there are ways to help these, these organizations out. If you found this to be inspiring, you've got financial resources, kick them to these groups. If you've got time on your hands, if you've got skills to share, get them to these groups. If you just wanna learn from these groups and, and do your own thing, get in touch with them, start this conversation, keep this conversation going. Um, there is a lot going on in this city to be really, really inspired by. And I am have just been like utterly honored to have had the privilege to um, be moderating this conversation with all these amazing folks. And I hope um, that this is the start and the continuation of a long process and not just something we forget about when this meeting ends in a second. So thank you everybody. Um, this was this was amazing.